In this video, we'll set up the ESP32 PWM peripheral using Zephyr OS to smoothly fade an LED in and out. If you're new to ESP32 on Zephyr OS, I recommend watching my previous videos first, especially videos 1 and 2 that go over device tree basics. PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation. For electronics, we can think of a pulse as a short burst where the y-axis is voltage and the x-axis represents time. In the context of PWM, we can think of a sequence of pulses as something resembling a square wave. This square wave is sometimes also called a pulse train. If this is the first time you learn about PWM, the terminology may seem confusing. However, if you understand just the two most basic attributes of a PWM waveform, you'll be able to derive most other properties using only basic arithmetic. In fact, we've already met the first basic attribute. The pulse width is the time taken from the start of the pulse until the end of the pulse. Simple. The second attribute is the period. The period is the time duration between the end of one pulse to the end of the next pulse. Again, very simple. Let's derive another useful term from the pulse width and period. The duty cycle of a PWM waveform is the proportion of the period that the pulse lasts. So it's simply pulse width divided by the period. The duty cycle is usually expressed as a percentage. For example, a duty cycle of 100% means that the pulse width is the same as the period. In other words, the voltage level is always at the high level. A duty cycle of 0% means that there is no pulse at all. This is equivalent to the voltage level always being low. A duty cycle of 50% means that the pulse width is half the duration of the period. The voltage level is high for half the time and low for the other half. Basically, we are turning whatever is powered by this signal on and off, over and over again. Pulse width modulation then, or PWM, continuously changes the amount of time the signal is high and the time the signal is low. In other words, continuously changing the pulse width or duty cycle over time. In this animation, we see that the duty cycle changes between 0% and 100% repeatedly. This is how we make the LED fade smoothly in and out. Let's explore one more important concept related to PWM, namely frequency. Frequency is the number of periods in one second and is measured in hertz. In this example, each period takes exactly one second. Therefore, the frequency is one hertz. Let's change the pulse train so that the periods are shorter. Now, there are four periods in a second. Therefore, the frequency is 4 hertz. If you know how long each period lasts for in seconds, you can calculate the frequency directly by taking the reciprocal of the period. In other words, Frequency is calculated as 1 over the period. Also note that frequency is independent of the duty cycle. 
as long as the period stays the same, the frequency stays the same. Now that we have a basic theoretical understanding of PWM, let's set up a circuit and write some firmware to smoothly fade our LED in and out. Once we get the example up and running, we will learn why PWM works. The circuit is about as basic as it gets. All we need is an LED and a suitably sized current limiting resistor. I'm using a red signal LED with a forward voltage drop of 2 volts and a maximum current rating of 20 milliamps. Therefore, a 470 ohms resistor should limit the current to just under 3 milliamps when 3.3 volts is applied on the output pin of the ESP32. That should be plenty for our example. The LED is connected to GPIO pin 25, which is physical pin 10 on the ESP32W rover, and the resistor goes to ground. To wire this up is very simple. I like to use two breadboards since the dip adapter is quite wide and would hide most of the breadboard pins if it was put in the middle of one breadboard. Connect the LED's positive terminal to GPIO pin 25, which is physical pin 10 in this example. The 470 ohms resistor goes in series with the LED's negative terminal and connects to ground. Easy. Next, let's see how to program the firmware to fade the LED in and out. Just like in the previous videos in this series, we start by updating the device tree overlay file with the appropriate compatible. But how do we find the right compatible? There are a few different ways that I typically go about it. The first way that I use most often is to look at the device tree bindings index page. In fact, I have this page bookmarked in my browser. I've included a link to the page in the video description. Since PWM is a pretty common peripheral, there's a good chance that Zephyr has a generic binding for it. So I look under the generic or vendor independent section and search for something that looks promising. In this case, we're looking for something PWM related and the PWM LEDs compatible seems to be a strong candidate. Okay, so this is the PWM LEDs parent node and it has one required property called PWMS. The type is a p-handle array. This may sound a bit complicated and foreign if you're not familiar with the device tree specification. Since we've kind of skirted over device tree data types in Zephyr so far, this might be a good time to get a better understanding before we proceed. Zephyr defines 11 property value types. Let's go through some of the most relevant for us. Int is a 32-bit unsigned integer. It's also called a cell in device tree parlance. It's specified between a set of angle brackets and you can indicate a hex value by using the 0xff style. An array consists of zero or more cells separated by spaces. A p-handle is a reference to a node label in the device tree. I think of it as standing for pointer handle. You use the ampersand in front of the node label, like we did in video 1 with ampersand GPIO 0 to refer to the node label for GPIO controller 0. A p-handle array combines a p-handle with zero or more cells. These cells are often referred to as specifiers. So, ampersand GPIO 0, space 0x00, space 0x10, contains the p-handle ampersand GPIO 0, 
and the two specifier cells 0x00 and 0x10. We can see that the PWMS property requires a p-handle array. So we'll probably need to refer to a controller of some kind. And the specifier cells will provide some parameters related to that controller. Maybe. So what should we do next? Notice the child bindings part. This tells us that the PWMS property is required for any child nodes of the PWM slash LED compatible. In other words, we should create a child node using an Espressive specific controller. Let's look under the Espressive vendor section for bindings that are specifically for the ESP32 board. We can see that there's a PWM in one of the bindings called Espressive, ESP32 hyphen MCPWM. Let's open the link. Aha, it's a PWM controller, but it looks like it's meant for motor controls, not LEDs. Nothing else really jumps out at me from the other Espressive listings. Apart from the motor controller, there's no mention of PWM anywhere else. Let's try another method to search through the bindings to see if there's something we've overlooked. The second way I look for bindings is to browse the file system for the bindings YAML file. I start in the Zephyr slash DTS slash bindings directory and go from there. Of course, you can search using your favorite file search tool for a wildcard, or you can look at the directories that seem most interesting. Let's check out the PWM directory first. Interestingly, we see some Espressive files, ESP32 LED C and ESP32 MC PWM. The second file looks very familiar. In fact, it's our old friend, the motor controller PWM. Let's open the Espressive ESP32 LED C.yaml file. It has the word LED in it, and it's in the PWM folder, so that sounds very promising indeed. And, as we thought, this seems to relate to the LEDC controller, meant to control the intensity of the LEDs using PWM. Thankfully, Espressive has provided some instructions and example for us in the description. Very helpful. Let's scroll down to the bottom of the file to see the actual binding information. As expected, the compatible is the same as the file name. It may not be obvious why it's called LEDC, since this is specifically for PWM but I presume that Espressive named it such to stay consistent with how the ESP32 peripheral is named in the official Espressive documentation. The ESP32 technical reference manual refers to the peripheral PWM as motor control PWM and LEDC as the LED PWM controller. This file includes three other YAML files. Let's have a look at pwmcontroller.yaml first. It tells us that PWM controllers require the pound PWM hyphen cells property and that it is a cell or int. And in the description, it helpfully explains that the property value refers to the number of items to expect in a PWM specifier. Where did we hear about specifiers again? Ah yes, those are the cells following the p-handle in a p-handle array, aren't they? And indeed, if we go back to the Espressive ESP32 led c.yaml file, we see that the very first property is pound pwm cells. And it specifies a const 3. 
This means that any device tree node that wants to use this compatible must provide three specifiers in the PWMS property. Wait a minute, I hear you say. How do you know that this refers to the PWMS property? There's an extra S at the end there, you know. Well, I know it because it says so in the Zephyr documentation. The Zephyr development tools automatically strips off the trailing S. The documentation also tells us that the binding for each PWM controller has to name the specifier cells. And indeed, at the end of the Espressive ESP32 LED-C.yaml file, we see a section called PWM cells with three specifier names, channel, period, and flags. These names are quite helpful. The channel probably refers to the ESP32's 16 PWM channels that can independently produce their own PWM signal. In fact, we see under the child binding property that a channel number from 0 to 15 inclusive is required for any children of the ESP32 LED C controller. There's also a requirement to specify the timer, selecting one out of the four provided in the enum. The second specifier is named period. This may be related to the PWM period we learned about in the beginning of this video. Finally, there are some flags. Not sure what flags are available, but I'm sure we can find more information in the documentation. We can find documentation for all the Zephyr peripherals by going to the main documentation website, Hardware Supports and Peripherals. Click on the PWM link and we get the PWM peripheral related documentation. Let's scroll down a bit to see if we find something interesting. Hmm, PWM polarity flags. That sounds promising for the flag specifier we just found out about. Let's continue scrolling. Ooh, jackpot. There's a PWM DT spec struct and associated device tree macro to populate it from the device tree node. This is very similar to our previous video defining keys and switches. The PWM DT spec get by name contains some helpful information about the PWMS property. It even provides a few example device tree nodes. Indeed, we were right to guess that the PWMS property requires a PWM controller, the channel, the PWM signal period, specified in nanoseconds, and flags, which in this case seems to be just the PWM polarity, which is a fancy way of saying active high or active low. We now have all the pieces required to start updating the device tree overlay file. Let's open the ESP32.overlay file and remove all the existing nodes, since we don't need any of them for this application. Then, let's declare a new node under the root node and call it PWM LEDs. Do you remember what we need in the device tree node? Well, first of all, we have to specify what the compatible is. And in our case, that's PWM LEDs. Recall from our previous discussion that any child nodes of PWM LEDs require a PWMS p-handle array property. So let's create a child node and call it fading LED. Let's give it a node label with the same name to ease the access from the code. Let's define the PWMS property by giving it a value. The first cell is a reference to the controller we want to use. As we found out, this is called LED C. If we have a quick look at the ESP32.dtsi file, we can see that there is an LED C0 controller specified at unit address 0x3FF59000. We can check the ESP32 documentation to confirm that this is indeed correct. Next come the three specifier cells. First, the channel number. Let's just put channel 0 for now. Then, the period in nanoseconds. Let's put 10,000, which is a frequency of 100 kHz. 
And finally, the flags. We'd like the normal polarity, so we choose PWM polarity normal, so that the signal is active high. To access the device tree node from our application code, let's define a PWMDT spec struct and call it fading LED. As in our previous videos, we'll use the DT spec get family of macros. In this case, PWM DT spec get with the fading LED node label as a parameter to DT node label. Let's try to build the project now to see if it works. Oh no, we've got an error. And what's worse, it's a cryptic error. What does this double underscore device underscore DTS underscore ord mean? Well, it clearly failed in our PWM DT spec get macro call. How about we try to search for those underscore references in the build directory? Let's grep for DTS or 28 inside all the files in the build directory. Oh dear, nothing. We seem to be properly stumped. What are we going to do? It's in moments like these where taking a break and bring ourselves a nice hot cup of tea might help. Luckily, there's a handy troubleshooting guide on the Zephyr Project website. Let's see if there's something that can help us there. Aha! The build process seems to throw away a lot of the intermediary files after they're no longer needed, but we can keep them by using the dextra c flags save temps equals obj flag. Let's try that. Okay, it's building. And we get the same error, which is to be expected. Let's search for the string there is complaining about in the build directory now. Jackpot, there seems to be a reference in the main.c.i file. Let's have a closer look. This seems to be the initialization of the fading LED struct. And device DTS or 28 refers to the device, or in this case, the LED C0 PWM LED controller device. Something seems to be wrong about that specific device. Let's have a look at LEDC0 in the generated Zephyr.dts file. It seems to be there. Oh, I see. It has a status of disabled. Maybe that's why there's an error when our code tries to refer to it. So how do we enable the LEDC0 controller? we have to add a property to the esp32.overlay file. Let's add state equals OK and try to build again. And let's do a pristine build, just in case, so that it cleans up all the intermediate files from before, just to be sure. Great, the build worked. Next, we update the main.c file. Just like in previous videos, we must check if the PWM device is ready, so let's put that first in the main function. I'm sure there's no way this won't work, but hey, let's try to build it. Just out of an excessive sense of precaution. What? Another error referring to device DTS or 28? I thought we fixed that already. But hang on a minute. This looks a bit different. The previous error said that the device was undeclared. Now it's the linker that's complaining about an undefined reference. It's time to brew another cup of tea and go debug a bit more. Let's see how the PWMDT spec get macro expands. Let's go to the definition of PWMDT spec get. Okay, so it just uses another macro, pwmdt spec get by idx. Let's see its definition. All right, it's populating the struct. This looks familiar. And to initialize the dev member of the struct, uh, it uses the device dt get macro. Okay, let's go to its definition. Ah, that's interesting. Notice in the comments for this macro, it says that if you get an undefined reference at linker time, we may need to enable any required kconfig options. So 
we need to check that to ensure that our device driver is being compiled. That sounds promising. We've identified a possible reason for our mysterious error. And it seems like we need to enable the appropriate device driver. But which one? The Zephyr documentation has a helpful search page where we can look for appropriate kconfig options. I've included a link in the video description. Let's search for PWM and LED and see what we get. Config LED PWM and Config LED PWM ESP32 look very appropriate. But wait a second, it says that the default is yes. So they should work already, right? Interestingly, they both seem to depend on config PWM. Let's have a closer look at that option. Aha, it looks like this option is not enabled by default. Let's enable it. When trying out new options, I find that doing it through the menu config tool is quite easy. If you've ever compiled your own custom Linux kernel, you'll know the interface well. ESP IDF also uses menu config. The WEST tool allows us to call menu config by running WEST build minus T menu config. The documentation tells us that we'll find this option under top and then device drivers. And there it is. Let's enable it and look under the submenu. And indeed, the ESP32 PWM LED driver is now enabled by default as well. Let's save the config and try to build again. And it works now. But wait a minute. Let's try to do a clean build using the minus P option for a pristine build. Oh no, our error is back. Let's look at menu config again. The PWM drive option is not enabled anymore. What's going on here? Any options you change in menu config are only valid until you clean out the build directory. We need a more permanent way of enabling our kconfig option. The easiest ways to do that is to add a local file, kind of like an overlay file, but for kconfig. Let's name the file prj.conf and place it in our application root directory. Let's add the option config pwm equals y and save it and build again, using minus p to make extra sure. Finally, success. It's taken us a long time to get here. But finally, we can start to think about the PWM logic for fading an LED in and out. As we learned in the beginning of this video, we can make a look to our eyes like the LED is fading in and out by increasing the pulse width over time and then decreasing it and so on. Another way of putting it is that we increase the duty cycle from 0% to 100% and then down again to 0% and repeat this in an endless loop. Zephyr has a handy function to set the pulse width called PWM set pulse DT. It takes a PWM DT spec and the pulse width in nanoseconds as arguments. To start with, let's see if we can make the LED blink by using the PWM driver to set the duty cycle to 0% then 100% and back again. It's not really PWM, I know, but it's a good first test to see if we're on the right path. Let's build and flash the board. And nothing. That's disappointing. What's going on? Okay, think through everything we've done. Oh no. We haven't told our system anything about which GPIO pin we'd like to use. How embarrassing. I'm glad nobody's watching us right now. The GPIO pin configuration is best put in the device tree. But there weren't any specifier cells for GPIO pins for PWMS, like there was for GPIOs in our previous videos. Let's look up the documentation for our PWM LED driver, Espresso VSP LED C. Aha, the documentation says that we should use pin control to map between the PWM channel and the GPIO. 
It also says that the default pin mapping is defined in the board specific ESP32 pin control.dtsi file. So let's open that file up and see. Nope, no mention of LED0 underscore default to be seen. It looks like we'll have to define our own pin mapping. But what is pin control anyway? And how is it different from the GPIO drivers that we've used in previous videos? The intent of the Zephyr project is to use pin control to handle pin configuration and multiplexing poor peripherals, whilst GPIO drivers are used for manually controlling GPIO pins. So for the PWM LED peripheral, it makes sense to use pin control to handle this. Since different microcontroller vendors apply widely different techniques to multiplex and configure their GPIO pins, pin control helps us to create a common interface to make our application code more portable. Pin control uses the concept of pin states. For example, a microcontroller might have its pins in a certain state when operating normally, its default state, if you will. But during a low power mode, the pins may need to go into a different state, a sleep state, to conserve energy. To represent the pin configuration in the device tree, Espressive uses grouping to organize the pins. This means that we define a group of pins with common pin configurations. For example, we can group all the pins that have a pull-up resistor. The pin configuration states are standardized by the Zephyr project. If you're interested in understanding more about the background and usage of pin control, I've left a link to a very good video instruction in the description below. First, we'll create a new child node under pin control. The pin controller specifies different states, so let's define a default state for our LEDC0 controller and call both the node label and node name LEDC0 underscore default. We'll use a group since that is required for the ESP32 and then provide the LEDC CH0 GPIO25 macro as the cell value for the pin max property. This macro is defined in one of Espressive's libraries and it maps LEDC channel 0 to GPIO pin 25. I've checked to make sure that this macro is defined, but this is not a guarantee if you're using a different pin or board. How should we configure the pin? The ESP pincontrol.yaml file shows us what properties are supported by the ESP32 board. The only property I think we'll need for this application is to enable the pin for output using the output enable property. That should be all we need to do for the pin control node in the device tree. Next, let's connect pin control to the LEDC0 controller. We can specify several states under a peripheral controller, but in our simple example, we only have one state, LEDC0 default. Therefore, we'll bind the first state to the property pin control 0. If we had more pin control states, they could be bound to pin control 1, pin control 2, and so on. We'll also give this state a name, just default will do. Recall that the ESP32 LED PWM controller has 16 channels we could use. Let's specify the channel we are using. We chose to map channel 0 to GPIO25 in our default pin control configuration above. We specify the number of address cells and size cells we use in the reg or reg property. In this case, there's just the address cell. So we put a 1 there and 0 for the size cells property. Build and flash, and see that the light is flashing on and off. Let's look at the oscilloscope as well. And indeed, every second the pin goes from 0 volts to 3.3 volts, just as we expected. But this is really cheating, and PWM isn't doing anything different from us just manually turning the GPIO pin high and low. Let's add a middle state where the duty cycle is 50%. And now we can see that the LED is changing intensity from zero and two levels of intensity, 
and on the oscilloscope we can see that the middle state uses PWM at 50% duty cycle and the frequency is 100 kHz, exactly like we expected. Very neat. However, there are two things to note from the LED intensity. First, the human eye doesn't detect the intensity in a linear fashion. Second, the transition from intensity level to intensity level is very noticeable. We'll need to have smaller intervals between each intensity level if we'd like to make the fading effect smoother to the human eye. So let's try to encapsulate the calls into a function that can vary the intervals automatically for us. Also, instead of the k-sleep function, let's configure a timer on the SP32 to trigger an interrupt at a given interval and call our new function. Let's start by defining some parameters. We'll have to experiment with how many steps we want from 0 to 3.3 volts. Let's call it num steps and make it 3 for now, to keep it the same as our existing example. But we know that we'll have to increase that in the future for a smooth fading effect. The other parameter is our sleep time between each PWM duty cycle change. Let's call that sleep delta msec, and say 1000 for now to keep it at every second. I'm pretty sure we'll have to reduce that in the future as well. So, we'd like our code to change the pulse width between the three steps every second. Of course, we could use the ksleep function in an infinite while loop, but that's not a great way to go about things. Instead, let's take advantage of the ESP32's timers. Timers work similarly to the GPIO interrupts we've created before, but instead of triggering on a GPIO event like an edge, the timer triggers at a time interval. Setting a timer up in Zephyr is easy. First, we use the kTimerDefined macro to define and initialize the timer. Using the macro allows us to do this at compile time. kTimerDefined takes two arguments, a name to give the initialized kTimer type and the name of a function to call whenever the timer goes off. We'll call the timer led delta timer and the function led delta timer handler. The function takes a reference to a kTimer struct as an argument. So let's define the function with an empty body for now. Note that the kTimer define macro must appear after the function has been declared. We can then start the timer in the main function by calling kTimer start with the timer name and the timer period. We have to specify two periods. The first period is the initial timer duration when just starting, and then the subsequent timer periods. For us, they're the same duration. OK, now we have a timer that calls a function on a regular basis. But by how much should we change the pulse width each time the function is called? Let's keep things simple and not worry too much about being precise. It won't matter much in our case. Let's define a variable to store the change in the pulse width for each time interval. Let's call it uh, pulse width delta n sec. If we divide the period evenly into the number of steps we want, we should get a good value. Since the period is given in nanoseconds, this variable will also use nanoseconds. Let's also declare the variable as a static UN32 type and initialize it to zero. Next, let's implement the function itself. If we think about it, there are two directions for the intensity of the LED. First, it grows more intense, and then when it reaches maximum intensity, it turns and starts decreasing in intensity. Let's create a Boolean variable, or predicate if we want to be fancy, called increasing intensity and set it to true so that the LED starts by increasing its intensity when the code first runs. In the function, let's check for the state of the predicate, and if it's true, we want to keep increasing until we've reached num steps. 
let's create another variable called steps taken to store this information and check whether steps taken is less than num steps. If it's less, then we set the new pulse width using the pwm set pulse dt function. Let's create a variable called pulse width nsec to store this. Then we increment the steps taken by one and update the pulse width nsec variable with the delta. Otherwise, if we've reached num steps, we swap the predicate, decrement steps taken, and subtract the delta. And let's do the equivalent when decreasing the intensity. I'm not a great programmer, so I'm sure there are much better and nicer ways to implement this logic, but this will do fine for now. Finally, we calculate the change in pulse width that our program will make in each step by setting pulse width delta nsec equal to the period divided by the number of steps. Let's build, flash, and see whether it works. And it does. Now we just have to modify the num steps so that the transition between each pulse width change is not noticeable and also modify the sleep delta m sec to make the transition appear smooth. 120 seems to work quite well. Do note that the intensity seems to change less and less as we reach the maximum intensity, and it appears to change more quickly when we are close to the minimum intensity. Our pulse width is changed in a linear manner. However, the intensity perceived by our eyes is not linear. So if we'd like to make it even smoother, we could model an exponential increase in the pulse width. But I'll leave that as an exercise if you're interested.